Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host Sana Makpool with you at BTV World. In today's show, we will be taking a look at two important stories. The first is with reference to what is going on at the economic front in the country, something that of course is of great concern uh, to the entire population in Pakistan and something that we have been mulling over, especially with regards to the IMF program. Um, we're only a one step short of the staff level agreement, but a lot of the measures that were under discussion um, have technically been sorted out. Uh, there have been a lot of measures that the government has rolled back that were earlier announced um, in the budget um, and of course it remains to be seen uh, what is going to happen uh, with regards to the tax rates um, and then of course other measures related to salaries and pensions as well and how it's going to have an impact on the economic situation. Um, of course in terms of the macroeconomic macro sense this is a good first step because this is going to bring about uh, more confidence uh, of the investors in and of course other bilateral um, uh, money that is going to be coming into Pakistan would also be quite helpful but then again whenever we talk about these issues it is a point that Pakistan has come to before as well um, and we keep coming back to this point again and again and what really needs to be done is the structural and fundamental reforms that are required uh, for the country to be able to progress in such a manner that we are actually um, be, uh, in fact be able to avoid these circumstances in the future so we're going to be talking about that more in detail um, the immediate and the long-term impacts and the kind of measures that are required for us to not be dealing with the IMF again. In our second segment of the show today, we will be taking a look at the Prime Minister's visit to Gavadar. This is the second visit of the Prime Minister to Gavadar in a short span of time. Uh, the main highlight of today's visit has been the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding between the Indus Hospital and the Gavadar Development Authority. Um, and of course, there are many other projects that the, uh, the province has been witnessing for a while now. The development of Balochistan has been on the forefront of the priorities of previous governments as well. But what, in fact, is needed for the development of Balochistan and the kind of implementation of the action plans that is required, we'll try and focus on that. And of course, other projects uh, that are uh, important to not just Kabadar, but the entire province. So that is going to be our focus in this second segment of the show today. For this and more, I've been joined in the studios, as always, by Farooq Batafi and Raja Faisal. And for our first segment, we'll be joined online by Dr. Kesar Bengali. He's an economist and Dr. Niaz Murtaza, a political analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us today. I'll start with you, Dr. Niaz. When we look at the situation currently, this, of course, um, is a hopeful sign or a good first step in terms of the situation that Pakistan has been in or the economic challenges that it has been dealing with in the recent times as well. Uh, so, of course, if we are getting the IMF bailout package, uh, then this is a good first step and will have positive impact on the economy. But, of course, there are different measures uh, that the government has uh, agreed upon uh, in order to be able to get this package. How much of an impact those measures are going to have in the short and long term on the people? I'd like your take on that. And then, of course, uh, what it means in the longer sense for our economy. It's an unfortunate uh, recurring feature that, you know, every government in Pakistan's history in this century has left a crisis for the new incoming government. And among the four crises that we've had this century, I would rate this as the second most severe one after the one that uh, the Musharraf government left for uh, People's Party. So in terms of, you know, current account deficit, fiscal deficit, inflation, interest rate, uh, your foreign reserves, this is really a very severe crisis. And unfortunately, as always, Pakistan had, had to turn towards IMF to be able to, you know, replenish its foreign reserves. But unfortunately, you know, as always, the IMF puts so many strict and fairly unreasonable conditions uh, that, you know, they have a huge impact on, first of all, you know, the poor people in terms of, you know, higher inflation, more taxes and so on. And then it also stalls your economic growth. So what we are going to have over the next 12 months at least is a period of fixed fiscal contraction, economic contraction, which will lead to higher inflation and also a lot of, you know, uh, loss of jobs, etc. Hmm. So now uh, the issue is, you know, how uh, to, you know, get out of it. And the main way then uh, for Pakistan is to, you know, try to attract new investment. So because, you know, 
uh, what you have is a situation where jobs are going down, investment is going down. So you have to attract more uh, investment somehow, whether it's local investment or foreign investment. So that will be right. the real challenge for the government, because if we just inflict the pain, but we do not really, you know, come up with a new way of making sure that we never go back to the IMF, then we we'll again be back into the situation of, you know, another government handing over another crisis after two, uh, three, four years. So it's important to, you know, get your exports going, get your absolutely. industry going and get investment going. Right, absolutely. Dr. Kesar, when we when we look at the, the kind of negotiations that have taken place with the IMF and where we stand now, um, of course, um, it, when we look at the situation overall, it seems to be a good step forward for Pakistan, and perhaps it is in the macroeconomic sense as well. But if you were to deconstruct this uh, uh, agreement of sorts that we've had so far, um, what exactly is it that is uh, working in our favor, and what measures do you think are going to be challenging enough for them to be called uh, damaging and doctor sir can you also speak to the uh, uh, questions or discussion about uh, the super tax that uh, that has been imposed thank you very much uh, for having me on this program uh, this agreement with imf is is just uh, oxygen on a ventilator. The economy is bankrupt. And it just allows us to survive for a few more weeks uh, onwards. Uh, this will, the next tranche that will be due will come with more conditions and more uh, hard decisions government will have to take. I think your earlier question that you placed is how can we get out of this cycle of going to the IMF every time. The fact is there are two caps which have always to be monitored uh, for our view of the economy. The one is the budget deficit and the other is the trade deficit. Uh, our, whenever that gets out of hand, meaning expenditures exceed revenues, <laughs> by a very wide margin, and that's what is happening. Our expenditures have continued to, to exceed, and the expenditure revenue gap has continued to widen, and the import-export gap has continued to widen. Today, for every 100 rupees of revenue, we, uh, our expenditure is 200 rupees, rather 210 rupees. And for every $100 of exports, our imports are $220. Now, this is clearly not sustainable. And in my view, I, I may, with due respect, disagree with uh, Dr. Niaz Murtaza. Uh, while I agree that this is the long-term path forward, uh, there is no other path other than that. But the economy is very weak. Over the last 40 years, we have run down our uh, agricultural and uh, industrial infrastructure. Industries are closing down. Our macroeconomic framework actually favors these speculative sectors of the economy, which is stock market and the property market, at the cost of industry. In the short run, we cannot increase exports. And if industry is not functioning in the short run, we cannot increase revenues. So in my view, the only solution is to reduce government expenditure, that should include defense and to cut both. And both these cuts have to be pretty heavy uh, in order to stabilize the economy. Yeah, doc Dr. Kassa, Dr. Kassa, if we, uh, you know, talk about uh, obviously implications on economy, even if we talk about, uh, you know, the later phase of uh, General Pervez Musharraf's uh, uh, government, of course, it was full of, uh, you know, political instability at that time. And I think that was one of the factors that really affected the economy of Pakistan at that time. And same is the condition right now. Can we say that uh, the current political instability is, uh, you know, having a huge toll when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, economy being very fragile right now? And if there is further uh, political instability, that would be the factor that affects Pakistan's economy? 
And, and also, if you could add uh, to that just one second. I, I wanted him to actually conclude his question because essentially it was leading to the question of mm -hmm. holding next election. Was it not? Because every time you ask this question, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. All right, Dr. Gesser, I want to also <laughs> add, add to this and ask you with regards to what you were talking earlier about the cuts, especially in government expenditure and defense as well. Um, do you think that this is something um, that can actually be worked out? And if so, um, if we're talking about heavy cuts, um, how do uh, the current state that we're in, um, have we actually move towards achieving that? The, the first question on political stability. You know, there are countries in the world which have had lived with political instability. Italy is one example. Japan is another example. Italy, no government lasts more than two years, two and a half years. And there are other countries where this kind of political instability has happened. Belgium did not had elections which were inconclusive and did not have a government for eight to nine months. But their economies keep functioning and growing because the state has an agreement on how the economy should be managed. And the government that come and go, they just put some uh, uh, small bites to it. We don't have any agreement on how the economy is to be managed. In fact, the agreement is how to basically not let the economy function and run the economy on loans. This has been the basic economic policy for the last 20 years. And this has to change. So political instability, I don't think, is a is a bottleneck. There are countries in the world which are politically unstable, but their economies have not sunk. Uh, your other question, uh, Ms. Sana, uh, sorry, can you repeat that, please? My question was with regards to the cuts you were talking about, the cuts in government expenditure and defense and, and, and the way that this is going to have a good impact on the economy. We must move towards that, which is what you were saying earlier. Um, can you give me a, a sort of a, a framework or a plan that can actually be followed from the current state of affairs uh, to actually achieving that? Because we haven't really seen that happening in the past. So I don't know. I'm not sure how uh, the uh, state or the political parties are actually going to go about it. Well, you know, after the 18th Amendment, there were about 17 uh, divisions in the federal government which were supposed to be abolished. They have not been abolished. Only their names have changed. You abolish that and you then start saving money on uh, civil side of the government expenditure. And on the, on the uh, non-combat defense expenditure, there are huge uh, cuts that can be brought about. There are about a dozen cantonments on GT road from Lahore to Peshawar, uh, every, on average, every 40 kilometers. And these cantonments were built by the British when there was a, in the 19th century, when uh, there, there was a danger of, uh, or a threat of in Russian invasion during the Tsar's period. Mm -hmm. Now we have friendly relations up to Moscow. Uh, half those cantonments should be closed down and there can be huge savings and defense expenditure on that. Right. Uh, right. But sir, but, uh, but sir these cantonments are uh, for our eastern neighbor. Well, we can keep on arguing, arguing on that. Uh, Dr. Niaz Murza, uh, if you allow me, because I wanted to actually focus on sir, something that you earlier said as well. You spoke about government actually taking over uh, and every government actually taking its sweet time in coming to terms with what to do with the policy. And uh, one actually wonders that it is usually thought that uh, uh, it is the age of survival of the quickest, that uh, the quicker you actually adjust to po policy pressures, the better it is. But everything, it seems, in our country is slow. Our data collection is slow. Our data processing is uh, slow. Our political decisions on economic matters are slow. What is the antidote here? Because I, I see that this government will uh, I think uh, it says that it is going to stay in power for 14 months, but then we are going to have a caretaker setup. Mm -hmm. What exactly becomes of that then? And then another government will come that might take its own sweet time to adjust to the realities. And in the middle of all this, our policy is lost somewhere. Yeah, I mean, this is the critical issue here that, you know, in, uh, compared to the previous governments that came in, and had to deal with the crisis, those governments had a five-year horizon at least. Uh, this government only has, you know, a 15th month horizon at most. 
uh, you can never even be sure whether it will last 15 months or not because of you know it's very slim majority uh, in parliament and the fact that it's dependent on unreliable allies so uh, that is the thing so if you keep that in mind i would say that it has taken some brave decisions in terms of you know uh, increasing the fuel prices as well as coming up with a lot of new taxes on the rich including you know the one on super ta- the super tax that has been imposed today so even previous governments which had a five year mandate and had you know two thirds majorities did take as some of those uh, measures so it's important but this is just the start the problem is that you know our problems are so deep rooted this is this is just the first set of issues that have to be dealt with then there are so many other issues in terms of you know taxation reform uh, state enterprise reforms bureaucratic reforms getting exports going getting industry going and but dr saab you and i have had this discussion about uh, 10 times or 100 times in the past 10 years right and repeatedly every time we talk about these things we end up talking about what we need to do next and more or less they are the same things why is it that those things are not happening well that is the thing because you know no government has you know uh, undertaken proper reform that's what i was saying government with five year mandates and even two thirds majority pmln itself from 2013 to 2018 was the strongest of the three governments that we had after 2008 but they did not take many of the you know steps necessary uh, to you know have proper restructuring and reform it was just you know kicking uh, the the ball further up so now uh, you know uh, i think the uh, scope for those kind of kicking of the ball has vanished and you know everybody is pushing us to take reform and it's important that those reforms go all the way otherwise we'll have all the pain but right. again we not be able to revert the crisis right dr nas i also want to understand earlier you were talking about the 15 months time period and whether or not the government is going to be there uh, but that's a separate question as well when we talk about the uh, chances of uh, us being in the same situation all over again do we even have 15 months because considering the way inflation is going to go and uh, what we're hearing in uh, from the measures by the finance minister as well they probably have less than that to ensure uh, that the economy is at least on the right track well that is the thing you know uh, even stabilization takes you know one to two years where you you know are able to bring inflation down if we look at 2013 you know uh, it uh, pmln inherited fairly high inflation and it took a couple of years for it to go down uh, and now you know they just have 15 months uh, so you know they can't bring a situation where growth will restart within 15 months but you know if they want to win the next election they can do that by showing that they've taken hard reforms which will pay off in the future and that will require fairly sophisticated communication because the results will not be the fruits will not be there in front of everybody's eyes but if the policies are there then it can right. at least try to stop uh, now's hard reforms also means change and a change is unacceptable to quite a few people um and and perhaps it's not going to be that easy to digest for not just the pakistani people but other stakeholders involved as well do you think that this is something that is going to be um something in the, good for for the people running in, in the elections next will they be looking f- out for that well uh, you know of course a reform is difficult but i think then uh, you know i think the ideas are all there you know the basic thing as dr kesab bengali was saying you know are the two twin deficits you know you have to overcome the budget deficit and you have to overcome the current account deficit so increase in exports and foreign direct investment and increase your uh, tax revenues and cut down on your expenses so i think there are fairly good ideas it's not that you know we are out of ideas it's a matter of you know developing the political will and going ahead and you know uh, taking the jump uh, the ideas are all there but it's yeah doc- dr kasa the- yeah dr kasa if we talk about uh, super tax and uh, of course you know it would have its own uh, implications would it have any implications on uh, attracting fdi's investors can be attracted with that you can't raise taxes and expect investment to flow in investment flows where there are low taxes so this is certainly an anti investment uh, measure but in any case no nobody would be interested in investing right now given the tottering state of the pakistani economy 
it is just surviving on low day to day loans so let us forget about investment at this point of time but the point is that you see we have done this uh, some numbers uh, this is very popular to say that the rich don't pay taxes and if you tax them everything will be all right there are the numbers of rich in this country are very very small the absolute number of rich is very yeah. small even if you bring everybody into the tax net and tax them to the full extent total revenue you will get will not be very large and if that is not very large your basic problem of the budget deficit is not resolved so what is the point of these taxes i come back to my original position the only solution to plugging the budget deficit now is expenditure reduction the economy cannot cough up more tax revenue the numbers of the rich are very small the the productive side of the economy is very weak it cannot give you more indirect taxes so this is this is just a measure to uh, an optics for the imf it will in fact have a negative effect on business uh, environment right but no, I, no. i just want to also understand dr gasser uh, do you think that the imf uh, is not able to see beyond these optics certainly they can but i think the imf also has very limited options i may yeah. certainly understand that the pakistan economy is capacity to generate taxes is is limited but they are just trying to hit wherever they can and the government is just blindly following the imf's uh, balls uh, we are we are in a serious crisis and the fact that we can have an imf agreement right now does not resolve the crisis one bit the economy is uh, dysfunctional we are on a ventilator and until and unless I mean, there were some points being raised about other stakeholders agreeing to things if they don't agree the economy will continue to sink we but you are talking about expenditure cutting, cutting sir can't we actually get rid of soes and then uh, by doing that actually save a lot of money we have been divesting soi since the 1990s in the in the one year 1992 nearly 100 state enterprises were privatized has it done anything to our to improve our budget deficit no it has continued to gotten worse every every 100 rupees of additional revenue the government collects by whatever means its non development expenditure goes up by 110 So as long as that virus of non-development expenditure continuing to outpace everything else, we will not resolve. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Kasa, if we talk about uh, you know uh, uh, any economy that has uh, you know a large number of uh, middle class, it sustains all of the pressures. Uh, is it uh, you know uh, 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 Pakistan has lacked that in uh, recent years, and if Pakistan wants to increase that, what kind of uh, sort of uh, you know uh, advice you can uh, give to the government that how to increase that middle class so that any pressure that comes on economy it can be sustained? Well, increasing the size of the middle class or reducing the size of the poor population uh, the only solution is jobs if you create jobs people take care of themselves and jobs will only come out of the productive sectors of the economy it will not come out of the stock market or the property market it, we are we are shutting down industries and replacing that land with housing estates which are all empty and only speculative buying and selling takes place that that economy has to end and industry has to be promoted and the the first step in promoting industry in pakistan is to reduce gst rate 17% is a killer nobody will invest at 17% and nobody will invest at 13 14 15% interest rate i think these two numbers have to come down the uh, our calculations are that given the the manner in which gst operates the government's net return is at about 5% hmm. uh, there are so many leakages so if you reduce the tax rate to 5% you'll probably get very similar rates maybe slightly lower but then more industries will come up more manufacturing yeah. will take place 
and it will recover its space. Right, absolutely. Um, Dr. Niaz, uh, when, we, when we look at um, the, the kind of measures that we're talking about that are needed uh, for us to be on the right track and put the economy on the right track, a lot of it also boils down to uh, perhaps the will um, of the political parties and the decision makers and their capacity to be able to do that as well, especially when we talked about an agreement of, of what needs to be done with the economy. It requires consensus. It requires people to actually sit down and come to that conclusion. Um, and we haven't had that in so many decades in Pakistan. Um, how are we going to be able to hope to actually achieving that in the future as well? And if that's our only option in terms of uh, structural change or what is needed, um, and we're not getting that uh, till now, um, should we be looking for other options? Well, uh, you know, uh, the uh, consensus uh, in a sense is there. Uh, you know, it's a coalition government uh, consisting of, you know, 10 uh, uh, major parties. So that's already, you know, fairly large consensus. Uh, then other stakeholders, of course, you know, they also have an interest in ensuring that the economy doesn't collapse. It's only the PTI and one of it or two of its small allies that are out of the loop uh, at the moment. So uh, the ideas are there, you know, uh, the political support is also there. It's a matter of, you know, now implementing it, of course, you know, the 15 month uh, uh, duration is very short, but whatever it is, I think the main focus of the government should be on, you know, raising investment for exports. Of course, the local domestic demand is going to go down and nobody will invest to, you know, expand mm. uh, uh, production for local uh, consumption because, you know, domestic demand is going down. But, you know, if you can get investment for exports and that links to seed pack and the special economic zones that were supposed to be set up and which were never set up under PTI, uh, get Chinese uh, government because, you know, private investment will be very reluctant to come in. But if it has the backing of the Chinese government, then it becomes a different story. So it will help you overcome the job issue as well as, you know, help you overcome uh, the foreign exchange crunch that we face. So I think that should be the big focus on the government getting, you know, the special economic zones going and getting, you know, your exports going with Chinese help. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Dr. Kessel Bengali, uh, earlier you were talking about industrial growth and development. And I re recall one of your pieces or interviews where you actually pointed out that Pakistan needs to reactivate the PIDC, the Industrial Development Corporation, and similar kind of initiatives. Uh, on the other side, when we look at the kind of information that might be needed for economic growth, we don't see it uh, anywhere in the country. Is there a possibility that we see some kind of permanent uh, push towards all of this so that the uh, policy makers are better guided? On the other side, we are, uh, 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 you know, this super tax actually reminds me of Milton Friedman, who said that there is nothing more permanent than a, perm, uh, a temporary government scheme. Uh, do you think that this might actually frighten a few of the, uh, you know, business people as well? Or uh, is there a possibility that they might actually come to terms with it? Uh, I think the super tax is, 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 is harmful. And the sooner they re realize this, the better it is. Now, your other earlier question, I, I firmly believe that the private sector in Pakistan is extremely weak, inherently weak. Uh, it basically consists of shopkeepers. We don't have entrepreneurs. Uh, barring maybe half a dozen uh, companies that you can call a, with entrepreneurial talent. Uh, the state has to come back. The state has to invest. That is how investment took place in Pakistan. Pakistan's industrialization story is not the story of the private sector. It is the story of the public sector. It is, the, it is PIDC which set up industries, kept got it running, and then sold it to the private sector. No private sector took the risk and put in the capital necessary for these industrialization of the 50s and the 60s. That is where we have to go, with one change. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, PIDC's capital, PIDC's management was all uh, one uh, package. But I think what we have to do now is to government, it has to be a public-private partnership. Government puts up the money, and then in partnership with the private management, sets up industries, and once the industries get going, then government withdraws out of it. I think that is a model we'll have to 
adopt. Yeah. Otherwise, the private sector simply not invest. Right, yeah. Dr. Niaz, you know, if we talk about uh, uh, IT sector, of course, uh, there are uh, certain successful countries who have uh, created the billions of dollars uh, out of this sector. Do you think that Pakistan, with time, has actually failed to uh, exploit this sector and maybe there was uh, not a facilitation that could have been provided to entrepreneurs uh, re related to IT sector. That is why so many IT experts, they uh, you know, got their degrees from Pakistan, they got their certifications from Pakistan and they went outside and they, they are successful right now. But when it comes to uh, you know, contributing in IT sector of Pakistan, uh, you know, there is uh, almost zero uh, contribution from them. Uh, can we say that with time, Pakistan should have facilitated uh, this sector so that uh, we would have been earning billions of dollars right now? And uh, building on this point, uh, uh, Dr. Niaz uh, so since we were earlier talking about exports and growth as well, uh, uh, one catch-22 that Pakistan faces is uh, is that we don't have much of raw materials. So whenever we have to produce and export, mm. then we have to import significantly higher quantity. Uh, mm. Is there not a possibility that with uh, products like IT or software, mm. we can export without importing that kind of situation? So the government should be doubling down on IT sector. Yeah, definitely, you know, IT sector and, uh, you know, all, also other sectors and, so you know, I fully agree with Dr. Kessler's point that, you know, we have to have, you know, a government strong role in industrial development. If you look at the Asian Tigers, you know, they had a very strong industrial policy and they had these units uh, within, you know, the prime minister's office whose main focus was on getting, you know, industry going, your exports going. And that role has been lost in Pakistan for decades now, from 1980s onward. You know, we just don't have a very strong government role in making sure that there is industrialization mm -hmm. and there is an expansion in growth. So IT could be one a strong uh, sector and there could be other sectors as well. And that is where, you know, the role of the government has to come up. They have to uh, identify champion industries which will be encouraged to, you know, expand and then, you know, export uh, for Pakistan, provide them with the research, with the marketing support, with the logistical support, with the finance. So a very strong industrial policy is needed and I don't see that right now anywhere in whatever the government is doing. And that's why I'm saying, you know, that without that, uh, we are again going to be back in two, two, three, four years to a situation where we stabilize, we go through the pain, but then we again have a situation where our twin deficit starts expanding. So that's why we need to, you know, start with a strong industrial policy of, you know, identifying new sectors and helping them grow. Right, absolutely. I'll just come to the last question from Dr. Kesser as well, since we're running out of time. Dr. Kesser, earlier you talked about the um, entrepreneurs and, and perhaps the lack of entrepreneurs uh, in our country, and then also, of course, what the government sector has done for industrialization. Um, considering the situation we are in right now, uh, what can the government do to be able to facilitate or encourage the growth of entrepreneurs and startups? Do we really even have a space or or the kind of environment that is needed for entrepreneurs to and, grow? And Sana, with your permission, I wanted to seek a little bit of clarification from uh, Dr. Bengali as well. Mm -hmm. He was earlier talking about uh, the public-private partnership. Uh, sir, uh, I wanted to ask it earlier, but there was another question. Uh, do you think that it should actually expand to SEZs uh, under CPEC as well, this public-private partnership model? If I may, there was a comment that Pakistan does not have much of raw materials. That is incorrect. Pakistan is very rich in agricultural and mineral raw materials. It is only that over the last 40 years, we have built up an industrial, industrial sector based on imported raw materials. We have to change that. We are not short of raw materials, enormous raw materials. Mm -hmm. The other thing about public, uh, about the private sector, uh, if we have public-private partnership, mm -hmm. where the state is picking up the bulk of the capital requirement and picking up the risk, there are three factors in in in, in running an industry: capital and management. On top of that, there is the risk factors. Who who bears the risk? The, our 
private sector is not prepared to bear risk. They, today, they are into investments that have a six-month payback period. Uh, they are not even willing to wait a whole year for the payback period. So the government can take up that risk. Government can provide bulk of the financing. Let's say 70% of financing can be by government, 30% private party. And once you have that going, then you begin to build the base of private entrepreneurship. That is, it is somewhat long term, but that is the beginning we have. I must also say that we are not completely zero in terms of the capacity for private enterprise. We, we have come a long way, but uh, no private enterprise today it would be prepared. To some, first of all, they do not have the capital. Our, our rich uh, are not very rich. Uh, they don't have the capital and they are not prepared to take risks. So but Dr. Sir, uh, uh, sorry to cut you, but Dr. Sir, since you said that uh, we should be investing or the government should actually be building more enterprises right. or private uh, factories or companies, will it not further add to the government spending? Any government spending that is productive is good. It will add to your income, it will add to GDP. And it will, it, it will actually, what the problem with Pakistan is that government expenditure has been non-productive sources, where you don't have any return. You spend the money and it's down the drain. If you spend money on productive sectors, which is what we had done in the 60s and 70s, then every loan we took was repaid. Because the, if we took a loan for, say, the Indus Waterworks, Tarbela and Mangla, it it multiplied our agricultural production by four times. And the huge income that we got, we, we were able to repay the loan. That is the principle right. of taking a loan. Right. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Kesar and Dr. Neas, for joining us and sharing your views with Thank regards you. to the economic situation in the country. And we hope that we can actually see these measures taken, which are absolutely essential for us to get out of this cycle that we've been stuck in for many decades now. In our second segment of the show today, we will be taking a look at the Prime Minister's visit to Kavadar, uh, what all was discussed, um, and then, of course, uh, the kind of issues issues that are important uh, for the development of the province of Parochistan and Gawadar as well as well as the memorandum of understanding that was signed earlier today between the Indus Hospital and Gawadar Development Authority. For this, we have also been joined by senior journalist Mr. Shahid Rin online with us and he will be giving us more details with regards to this business. Mr. Shahid, can you hear me? Mr. Shahid, are you with us? Mr. Shahid, can you give us a, a, a few details with regards to the Prime Minister's uh, visit and, and, of course, the development of Gavadar uh, and the kind of project that we've, we've been seeing uh, coming in for a long time. Um, and we've seen the development of Balochistan being talked about uh, by different governments uh, and the emphasis has always been there. But I want to also understand what exactly is it that um, is in plan uh, for the province of uh, Balochistan and the kind of works that are being done at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shahid, can you hear, hear me? Mr. Shahid Rin, senior journalist, are you with us? I don't think Mr. Shahid can hear me, so I'm going to go to Farooq and I'm going to ask you with regards to what is going on in Balochistan. Uh, for starters, of course, there is the MOU that is signed today, um, and of course, that adds to uh, further measures that have been taken in the past as well to the development of the province in Gavada. Um, with reference to particularly this measure and then the kind of projects that are in line, um, do you see that there is going to be tangible difference in the development of Balochistan soon? Uh, right, uh, Sana, that is a very good question. And I think at this moment when we are looking at the uh, progress of development in Balochistan, I think it is these projects are going to become the engine of growth in the province. Uh, the biggest problem with CPEC related projects during the previous government was that there were concerns from the other party, from the investors. I think recently when the Prime Minister has spoken uh, to the Chinese Prime Minister, and then we also compared notes and then the Prime Minister also visited the uh, Gavadar area and there he met with the locals as well. There were multiple concerns from both sides. Hmm. So I think at this moment what the current government is trying to do is to build confidence mm -hmm. with A, with the uh, Chinese investors and their project, streamlining them, helping them take care of these issues. Prime Minister last time also highlighted some concerns, right? 
then they, they, this uh, uh, recently there were local body elections in Balochistan and in Gawadar, you know, uh, the party that won was uh, uh, concerning the, uh, the rights of the locals, right? Their one point agenda is Gawadar ko haqdo party, okay. it is called that. Uh, so um, at this moment, their concerns are there, healthcare problems are there, yeah. then the issue of uh, co commutation, uh, commuting, and then of course a water uh, a supply, and finally this trawler crisis, because uh, when the other uh, people from other areas come and trawl in th that water, what happens is that that actually takes away the generations of fish over there. Right. So at this moment, the Prime Minister is uh, going through this balancing act where he can uh, seek to satisfy all the concerned parties and then ensure that these development projects also stand up and they start delivering. Mm -hmm. At this mm -hmm. moment, I think the government will have to do much more, right. but the Prime Minister has shown the commitment that was needed. All right. Um, Faisal, we've also seen that, of course, the security challenges also remain and have existed in Balochistan and have also caused hindrances in its development in the past as well. Mm -hmm. And we're still faced with those um, as of now. Um, how are we going to be able to ensure the development of the province when we have uh, such threats uh, coming in and such challenges continuing to exist? Um, because, of course, this would also require long-term measures. Yes, and uh, uh, talking about the uh, security concerns, of course, uh, they were addressed by uh, our security forces and they mm. have been uh, constantly, you know, uh, safeguarding uh, Gwada. And if we, uh, you know, take the uh, recent incidents, the incidents, the number of incidents, they have uh, shrinked, number one. And number mm -hmm. two, if we talk about, uh, you know, intelligence-based uh, operations, during intelligence-based operations, many of the, uh, uh, you know, planners, they've been uh, uh, dealt with. And I think uh, this, is, uh, this is the way to counter the security uh, threats to uh, uh, Gawada. Moreover, if we uh, look at the, you know, um, BLA and BLF, they were the ones who were conducting lots of activities within Balochistan that uh, had a constant threat for uh, Gawada and CPAC project itself. But uh, in recent times, we saw that uh, Pakistan's Prime Minister, he went to uh, Iran as well and he had a talk, uh, talk with his counterpart out there mm. regarding security issues as well. So I think, uh, uh, you know, in, in coming days, it would uh, get more better. But if we talk about the development, see, if I look at uh, this visit of Prime Minister, I would uh, say that I think his keen interest in Gawada, uh, it is an evidence that uh, he is giving importance to uh, CPAC as mm -hmm. well as Gawada because uh, in uh, coming future, as we are seeing, uh, you know, fragile economy of Pakistan right now, mm -hmm. in coming future, if we keep on focusing on Gawada, on right. CPAC and on uh, SEZs, then of course uh, we can mend our ways within our economy. All right. And I think it's uh, it's a better step forward. All right. I believe Mr. Shahidrin has joined us. Can you hear me, Mr. Shahid? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so we know, of course, that the prime minister went to Gawada today. He also met with the local fishermen. Um, and the uh, major development that took place today was, of course, the MOU that has been signed. Can you give us further details on that and what all is going to be part of this process? Uh, today's uh, visit of prime minister to Gawada is uh, important uh, for the people of Gawada because today the government of Pakistan and the uh, Ministry of Health signed an agreement with Indus Hospital to establish a state-of-the-art hospital for the people of Gwadar. And other meetings were related to the development projects of federal funded and provincial funded. Within a span of time of one month, this is the second visit of Prime Minister which shows his interest in CPAC and Gwadar. So whatever we missed in last three and a half years, Prime Minister is trying to compensate it and it will give a good gesture to all the departments with the visits of Prime Minister and the Federal Ministers, the importance of Gawadar, it will give the impact on the development process. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Shah Andrin, for joining us and giving us the update. And of course, the development of Balochistan still continues to be a priority for the current government as well as it has been in the past. And of course, the Gawadar projects um, and specifically uh, this particular hospital that Mr. Shah was talking about is going to be very important uh, for the people of Balochistan. And we hope nothing but the best for them and for the rest of the country. That's a lot from the debate. We'll see you tomorrow.